Hi folks, this is Jay. What are you okay today? This is the last video in the series Preaching of Preachers. So it's five hours, over five hours of material. And uh, we're going to close now with. Um, I'm getting tired after talking about for five hours. And uh, so this is the last video. So I'm just going to pray just to get some, ask the Lord to give me strength. and and I hope these videos are a help to you Lord I ask for your forgiveness and cleansing today and I just thank you for your love and grace and Father I just pray you'd help me to finish this last video and that Father it would be a blessing and it would be a help and an encouragement and so Father I do pray that you would bless I do pray that you would encourage and I just pray that you would bless um, this video and I just pray it be an encouragement to people and so Lord I just pray that you'd use them for your glory in your name Amen so basically what I wanted to do is I just wanted to get back to what I was all about myself and uh, just to remind myself about my own training and my own journey in preaching and talk about a passion that's been a passion for me and uh, something that's been important to me in my life and I wanted to get back to it and it's reminded me of that preaching was the center of my own ministry and really um, I need to get back to it really and this whole series is also about me being reminded of the things that I've known the things that I've been trained in um, just to get back to that really so I'm quite tired now because I've talked four hours on preaching <clears throat> and uh, I'm just passing on all the knowledge that I've gained and that I need to remember and that I need to apply to my own life so we'll go through this a little bit again and uh, we'll see what the next topic is we've looked at uh, hermeneutics which is a very big topic we've looked at issues um, you want to talk about Greek grammar and all the rest of it and uh, you can start by reading that book if you go to the master seminary type in master seminary or type in master seminary in YouTube you can go and listen to John MacArthur and Steve Lawson on expository preaching and the series on preaching is excellent uh, and they will mention and you can also do courses there for free if you type in the master seminary uh, there are lectures on especially on YouTube that you can find on Greek and Hebrew and studying the Bible and they're very very helpful Basically, in hermeneutics, do exegesis, not eisegesis, basically. And, and what, what that means is, just try and study the Bible in its context. And not what you think the Bible should say, but let the Bible speak for itself by studying the Bible. Um, in page 189 it's got the first 750 books for an expositor's library so you can go there in this book expository preaching by John MacArthur and if you go to page 189 it will give you all the list of the commentaries and books that you can read far in excess of what I've mentioned and, and will help you it gives you all the books that you can read on the commentaries and etc et MacArthur gives you three principles of Bible study observation one writer says essentially awareness the general function of observation 
is to enable one to become saturated with the particulars of a passage so that one is thoroughly conscious of their existence and of the need for their explanation. Observation is the means by which the data of a passage becomes part of the mentality of the student. It supplies the raw materials upon which the mind may operate in the interpretive process. Interpretation We've got to deal with the language gap, study the language, the cultural gap, what the culture was at the time, and the historical gap, find out the history of the text, historical context of the text. And then thirdly, application, applying it to our own time, asking questions, are there errors to avoid, are there sins to forsake, are there promises to claim? Are there new thoughts about God? Are there principles to live by? MacArthur says, organize the passage, analyze the structure, do an exegetical outline. So, I'm going to tell you my method um, uh, this is just uh, an outline of Bible translations. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I don't know. Let's see if you can. I can get you to see it. Yeah. So that that gives you. So the so the the shorter it is, the more literal it is in its translation. So that tells you which is the most literal translations. So the American Standard Version, the King James Version, are more literal. The others up this line are more freer. And that's the list there, and uh, it tells you there. Okay, so, uh, you can pause it and try working out yourself, or read the book, page one three one one. So, uh, so. That's John MacArthur's notes, the way he, he makes his notes, sermon outline. So I just want to... Uh, I'm going to tell you my method, which I got from a guy which I'll show you. And then I'm going to put you onto a couple of books about preaching. Okay, I'm just getting this ready for later. couple of historical features in, in preaching. Is it is it there? Yeah there it is. There we are, Isle Dublin. The method I'm going to give you is from this guy, R.L. Dabney, for the Banner Truth. This is the method that of my preaching that I got from him, okay? Okay, um, here's the theory and the idea of this methodology of preaching. Uh, I think... Uh, 
Thank you. Before I, I, um, before I tell you the method, I'll just give you a little bit of history from this book, page 52, by, uh, by one of the writers. Nevertheless, the Puritans as a whole were dominated by a sense of the presence of God. They sought to be faithful to the word and to the plain practical preaching of the word. Some major Puritan right preachers who demonstrated great ability as expositors were Joseph Hall, 1574-1654, Thomas Goodwin, 1660-1680, Richard Baxter, 1615-1691, and John Owen, 1616-1683. Speaking of Goodwin, Brian writes, Comparing him with eminent contemporaries like John Owen and Richard Baxter, it has been said that Owen preached earnestly to the understanding, reasoning from his critical and devout knowledge of scripture. Baxter preached forcibly to the conscience, reasoning from the fitness of things, while Goodwin appealed to the spiritual affections, reasoning from his own religious experience and interpreting scripture by the insight of a renewed heart. Other significant Puritan expositors were Thomas Manton, 1620-1677, John Bunyan, 1628-1688, Stephen Sharnock, 1628-1680, also William Greenall, Greenhill, 1581-1677, a Puritan expositor to preach a major series of lectures on Ezekiel. All these men were diligent students of the word, seeking to clearly explain the truth of scripture to others. So that's just another list of historical information there. Um, so I'm going to give you my method um, basically R.L. Dabney uh, was trained in the history of rhetoric rhetoric is the art of public speaking so he read classical writers like Aristotle who wrote a book on rhetoric which is uh, been a very influential book. And basically what R.L. Dibney noted is that nature teaches us how to communicate and so this kind of classical method um, once you've done your exegesis, your historical grammatical method once you've done all that research, you've got all your material you've got your Bible verses and You've got a sense of what God wants you to do, then you've got to bring it all together, but how do you do it? Well, first of all, you've got to understand that the mind likes unity, that the mind needs unity. Now, that very simple principle is a very powerful, but a very effective principle. That the mind likes order. If you think about creation, creation is, is done in order. There's order within creation. The human brain likes to think in order. So that's the way nature is and that's the way we've been made. And therefore when we're putting all this material together, we need to put it into a, 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 a an order, a unity. So that's really important because a lot of preaching and a lot of modern hermeneutics don't realise this fundamental principle. They use a lot of psychology to influence the way they say how you should do a sermon. But just looking at the history of rhetoric, looking at the history of public speaking, uh, looking at the way the human condition is and has been for centuries, this desire for order is vital to learning and to public speaking and to preaching. So you need a structure to your message. You need an order. And there are one, three, five, three, four, five, five components to that order. First of all, the introduction. Then three points and then a conclusion. Now you might say, Jay, this is just so simple. I knew this already. I didn't need you to give me a long spiel for 
five hours before I got to this methodology. But the simplest method is the most profound method. The simplest method is the most effective method. The simplest method might sound simple, but there's a lot of thinking gone into it. It's a lot more complex than modern hermeneutics, uh, modern um, homiletic theorists give this method for gra uh, take for granted. You'll often hear in seminary, if someone uses a three-point sermon, people in the seminary will, students and lecturers will kind of snigger and think this is an outmoded method. But it's not an outmoded method. It's a it's a, a method that if you use based on the Bible, based on your material from your Bible, you're going to have a powerful effect if it's anointed with the Holy Spirit. So you're having a structure and you have an introduction, you have three points and a conclusion. Now, in your introduction, so introduction three points and a conclusion right so you first and you don't have to be uh, tied to that you can put four points or five points but generally don't have too many points three is good you can have two you can have four you can have five the point is make it structured and ordered but I'm suggesting three points in your introduction You can talk about some issue in the world. What what you're trying to do in your introduction is get people's interest, trying to engage people, trying to bring them into your world, trying to bring them into the world of the Bible. So you need to get your hearers' attention and then bring them from where they're at into the Bible you want them to see that where they're at that the passage that they're looking at is relevant to them so for example let's say you're preaching on John 3.16 right for God so loved the world that you gave you only, gave you only begotten son that whoever believed in him shall not perish but everlasting life right you can um talk about it, it, you could use anything you could use a modern issue modern modern question a modern um a modern uh illustration an illustration of the past um so, for example, um, you could take some issue in the news, some some issue that's been going on. Um, so there's a, 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 a news flash of um, an alcoholic who went and stole some drink uh, from a shop and got fined and, and has been to prison and there's been a hoo-ha because... Um, he he was he, he was put in prison and then he, they've let him out because of his alcoholism and his violence and stuff like that and they've they've let him out again and he's done again and and it's been on the news and stuff like that and you can say you know the question is and and so people are going to listen to it because it's a relevant topic so they'll be listening and you say you know I was just thinking you know can a leper change his spots can someone who's always had a behaviour of alcoholism or a behavior that is a, a bad habit and, and then you bring it home I mean we've all got bad habits haven't we that have been destructive or damaged us in some way so you've talked about relevance you've talked about something that they there's near to their home heart their own heart what they're concerned with so now that you've got you've engaged them now they're, they're listening in and then you hit them then I think John 3.16 can help us with this and answer this question. They're going to listen. What, the thing about this situation in John 3.16, the whole book of John, 
it's providing a time uh, providing people with such a a resource that it can that he's helping people to understand that they can change that they can move on for Nicodemus it was religion that was his bad habit there was the woman at the well who had had many men that was her problem the woman who committed adultery that was her problem and yet Christ was offering a new start for people and John 3.16 is a, a text that brings the heart of this so in my introduction I used something that was contemporary I, used, I went to the home situation where I brought it home about their own concerns but then I'm bringing them into the text I taught the broad outline of the book of John a couple of the other stories and I brought it in in a natural way so I'm not over facing them I'm not making it too heavy for them it's kind of like making a meal if you just put a three course meal if you put all the meal in your introduction make, let's say someone orders a three course meal and the person just brings the, the starter the whole meal and the dessert on one plate and gives it to the person it's too much your introduction is like a starter you don't want to put too much in your introduction in the starter you could have a little bit of lettuce and maybe uh, two a bit two bits or a little bit of um, uh, fish or something uh, little dainty bits or something you know in your starter and so in your introduction you not don't go too deep you're just bringing them into your passage bringing it in okay getting them ready preparing their minds asking them questions present a little bit of background information get them prepared and ready to get get into the world of the passage that you're going to give them make it an argument because an argument people like to follow so can a person change some people say yes some people say no what do you think when you're asking them a question like that and engaging them in a discussion then they're going to listen they're going to engage they're going to think so in your introduction you want to give some information about the text background information don't make it too deep don't overface them give one or two verses in the bible that will give them a, and help them to interpret that text you could say people have debated about the word world for god so loved the world some commentators have said that it's the whole world some people have said that it's just the world of the believers for God so loved the believers but if we go to the rest of John if we go to John's first letter and second letter and we look at the word world and we look at all his understandings of the word world it's my contention that it means the whole world generally and not just the believers you could say that or you could if you're a Calvinist you could go for the Calvinist so you're, you, 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 you give the starter you give something that they can engage with bring them into the world then paint a little bit of the background of the passage if it's a historical passage paint the historical if it's a doctrinal show the doctrinal background if it if it's uh, whatever the background of, or style of the passage give the relevant information that they need that will help them to understand the text try and engage them in discussion and dialogue by giving them some questions and present it as an argument is it this or is it that what do you think and build a case for your position uh, Lloyd Jones did that he would he would build an argument and he and it said he was like an eagle that soared and soared and soared and soared until it saw he, the eagle soared round the sun as it were and that's like Lloyd Jones argument he just circled round circled round and hovered round and hovered round and then the sermon was like a great, great crescendo, like 
a symphony. So that's your introduction. Then you have your first point, your second point, your third point. Your first point, have a clear, clear outline within you. Each of the first point, second point, third point. Start with something that will bring them into that first point. So, basically, um, first point is uh, God loves the world, right? So I can talk, I, I, to bring them into it, I said there's a story of a, a young, a, a preacher, and the preacher was... Um, the preacher um, had a kid and the kid wanted to help his dad carry these books up the stairs and the preacher helped uh, the, the little boy helped his preach, helped his, his dad and carried the books he was only five and he was helping but the little five-year-old couldn't carry some theology books and was crying and, and couldn't carry and stood at the bottom of the stairs crying with one of these theology books and the father came down and picked up his son and carried him and carried him up the stairs so when it talks about for God so loved the world God has a heart to carry humanity and care for humanity just like a father cares for his child but the burden was not the book, it was sin. And Christ had come to die and, and for sin and God had come to take that burden of sin away. So I tell us, you tell an illustration, that's not a very good one, but you tell an illustration or a story or something. People like stories and you tell it and it brings them into your first section. Then you build a case about God's love and get the text that prove that God is a God of love for people that prove that God uh, is a caring God a loving God to, to individuals that wants people to be saved and then you bring it on once you've done your illustration once you've proved it with the verses and explained it with the verses what it is then after that you give your application and spend a little bit of time on application so it's illustrate prove apply illustrate prove apply in the first part part illustrate prove apply so you prove it with scripture what your point is and then you have application so what's the application and you apply it you say well if someone came into the church who's been on drugs, maybe someone here tonight, you've come in and you're on, you've been on drugs and you come in and you just walked in and you think, what's it all about? You need to know that God does not want you to go to hell, that God cares about you, that God wants you to know him. And you're bringing it home. You're applying it. It means that God is willing for you to come to him God doesn't want you to turn away God isn't trying to trick you and you you apply it you can apply it with a story an application with a Bible verse whatever but you apply the text to the individual don't use we 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 today preachers are being polite using we 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 use the word you and don't be frightened of pointing to someone you God has come for you. God is meeting with you. God loves you. Apply it to them specifically. Yeah? So your introduction, your first point, bring them into the first point, illustration, prove your point with scripture, and then apply your point. And then the second, second main division, again, illustration, <coughs> prove your point scripture and application third point <coughs> illustrate prove your point with scripture application 
then in your conclusion, <coughs> all your sermon that you've done, there would have been ma one main theme that's come out of your sermon. One main theme that's come out that you've pushed and talked about and got them to try and see. And all through your sermon, you're aiming at the will. You're aiming to convert them. You're aiming to change them. You're aiming to direct them in in, in the way of God. You, you've got an aim. You're aiming at the will to get them to move from where they are to where they should be. It's no good aiming at things indiscriminately. You need to aim for the will. You're aiming to convince them that this is the right thing to believe and the right way to move. So you're in your sermon, it's, it's an argument that you're making. And the argument that you're making is, get, is you're trying to get them to move from A to B. In this case, you're trying to get them from being non-converted to converted. So you're making an argument. And basically, um, it's one message. One theme that it's like a nail. That through your three points, your introduction, your three points and your conclusion, it's only one theme. In this sermon, my theme is you need to be saved. That's what I'm driving home in this sermon. You need to be saved because, number one, God loves you. Number two, Christ died for you. Number three, Christ offers you. And it's the same point, but in three different ways. And you're aiming that one point, but in three different ways. And you're aiming at the will. You're aiming for a change. Okay? So, it's like a nail. And you've got a hammer. And you bang the nail. Bang it. You bang it in the door. Bang, bang, bang. And you hit that nail. Keep hitting it. You keep hitting it. You keep hitting it. You keep hitting it. Until it goes in the wood. And that's what you're doing in your sermon. It's one point. Bam, bam, bam. But you're hitting it three, four times with a hammer of your points. Bam, bam, bam. And you're aiming at that. And in your conclusion, it's that one point that's been said in three different ways. That one point that you ram home the final time. Right? So you're taking that same point, and in your conclusion, you're just bringing it home again. So if it was about conversion, press it home again. And bring all the points in. So what I do, let, let's say that my three points are... Uh, my introduction is a question, can a person change his spots? And um, My first point is that God's love uh, is there for us and for God so loved the world. We can change because God loves us. And if God loves us, that gives us hope that he can change us. And second point is that Christ was sent to die for us and that gives us hope that we can be changed. And the third is that God encourages us to believe in him by faith to receive forgiveness that means we can change and so those are my three points can a leper change its spots yeah can a person change and what i'm trying to do is get them saved so in my conclusion what i'll do is i'll, I'll i will not go off on a tangent or go off on some other topic i'm sticking to that now and i'll tell a story about someone who's converted i'll say there was a drug addict who went to prison for, for 15 years and was on heroin. And they came out and they went to church. And this uh, guy gave him a book about a drug addict. And he went home and he read it. And he was broken in tears. And at that moment he got saved. Yeah. Boom. I've hit them. And they've heard that. And then I say, and there was a university professor and he was really clever and he thought he was smart and he was a mathematician and one day he was walking across the road and an elderly lady stopped him and gave him a tract and he went home and he read it and he got saved boom i've hit them again and there's a scripture that says actually can a leper change its spots and ask the question and as we look at scripture we can see people who have changed paul was a murderer and he has changed boom i've hit them again So I'm bringing it home, that same point, and I bring all my points, my three points, and I bring them all again, I say them again, but I say them in a slightly different way, 
so they're not bored but I'm ramming on that same point and that is the leper can change his spots that people can get saved that people's behavior can change because of the cross of Christ in John 3.16 and that's my method and that's a classical method that has been used by Aristotle by preachers in the Bible preachers in the Bible use the method uh, and throughout history preachers have used it it's just a very simple method based on nature uh, that you can find and, it, and it's a structure that works every time and um, you can tweak it to suit your own personality maybe you want four points maybe you want five points whatever but you know how to put all that material together and structure it and it works every time as, a, as an outline now that's the structure of the sermon um, now I'm going to talk about preaching in church and preaching outside of church and issues concerning those issues preaching in church is different from preaching outside of church preaching in the open air is a different kettle of fish of preaching inside the church you need special training if you're going to preach outdoors it's not easy it's very very hard and it's very tough so you need some kind of training or you need some kind of character that is suited to it. Um, I spent five years debating with atheists on the internet. It was not a wise thing to do. I made a lot of mistakes. But I had a lot of backlash and attack and um, brutality towards me. But it toughened me up. It made me strong. So, when I'm street preaching, I, I'm prepared for the backlash, I'm prepared for the abuse. So, you, I do think you need, to, you need preparation for street preaching more than you do preaching. It's not as easy, it's a lot harder. So, you need some kind of training in that area. I would suggest you go out with a street preacher and learn from the street preacher myself for about a year just go and see how he does it or they do it and, and learn and then get involved with them all right um, in terms of preaching in the pulpit dress just dress plain and smart don't pr don't dress flashy you know people take the measure of the person the way they're dressed if you dress a flashy suit there's no point you're just trying to impress people and you're trying to attract attention to yourself just point just dress in a plain manner dress with sh with your shoes smart smart pants smart shirt go smart a lot of preachers today are dressing casual the dressing with jeans trainers and all the rest well God ain't bothered about the way you dress. Uh, you can turn up in jeans and trainers. But the way you dress says a lot about the way you view God. And people take note of that. But the message that you want to send to people is that God is the living God and that he is to be highly loved and not honoured and, and, and exalted. And that we want to mean business with him and we want to be keen and we and so dressing formally I think is the best way we've become too slapdash today there's there's a balance you can be too formal too stiff and there's been a reaction where everybody's informal but that means everybody's become sloppy I think the preachers need to look smart they need to look smart and they need to look presentable so you need to make sure that you wear nice shoes shine shoes iron pants iron shirt and a tie and you need to go with that kind of attitude if you were going to see the queen you would not turn up in your jeans 
and your trainers. You would turn up in your best. So turn up in a smart way. Spend time before you go, the night before or in the morning, praying over your sermon. Just pray, get on your knees, pray over the sermon. And just get your mind fixed on God. Forget about everything else. Fix your mind on God. You've got a great work to do. People are depending on you on a Sunday morning, Sunday evening. They're depending on you to bring them a word. So just get on your knees. Any distractions that have took place, probably you'll get distractions, a phone call, a pastoral issue. you probably not getting on with your wives or kids or whatever. Something will happen. The devil will try to disturb your preaching and your mind. Someone in the church might be a problem or something. So all these things are going to kick off before you preach. So you just need to get down, get ready, get your mind ready, pray. Pray and, and say, Lord, I'm, I'm ready. Pray over your sermon, pray it into your heart, pray that you can live that sermon. And you just pray and keep praying. Then you trust and you hand it over to God. You say, Lord, I give you this sermon, I give you the service. You pray over the service, pray over the worship, pray over everything that's going to happen. Pray for the congregation, pray against the devil, just pray for the whole service beginning and end. And you make your way to the church. You go into the, you have a word with people, turn up early. If you're the pastor of the church, sort out whatever you need to sort out with individuals. Um, but if you are not the pastor, just turn up at the church. When you get turn up at the church uh, at a decent time. When you get there, ask, if you're the pastor of the church, you need to insist on your eldership to pray with you. And if they do not pray with you, you need to consider whether you should be in that church. You will do no good and you'll have a nervous breakdown if you stay in a church where you've got no eldership backing you. If you've got no one backing you, praying with you in your church you need to get out of that church because you're going to have a nervous breakdown you need to leave it you need prayer warriors you need some people in your church to pray for you God did not mean to be you a preacher on your own you need the prayers of God's people and if you're part of a congregation and you're not praying for your pastor then you don't deserve the pastor congregation should be praying for their preachers and you should be praying earnestly and often and especially before the Sunday service to let your pastor get in the pulpit and you haven't prayed is criminal when the pastor gets in the uh, when when you as a pastor get there you get your elders together and you say we'll pray if they don't want to pray you sack them you get rid of them and if they don't like it tough you say, we're not, I'm not having any elders on my leadership team who are not willing to pray with me before I preach. It's as simple as that. Play this video to them. And say, that's what I think. And if you don't agree with it, sack me or you be sacked. But you need people who are going to pray when you get into that pulpit. So... And you need them to come on fire for God, not half-hearted. Elders who come into the vestry to pray with you, who come in slapdash, come in the last minute, you need to tell them off. You need to tell them it's not good enough. Elders that are not getting on with other elders in the church, you need to tell them off. Say, you're quenching the spirit. You, you just need to deal with them. Tell them straight. You're not messing about here. If they want to be elders, they've got to be elders. They've got to be people who are backing you up. If they're not backing you up, then you've got to tell them. Because if you don't tell them, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. You're going to be, you're going to be in a mess. You need people to support you in prayer. And if the elders aren't doing it, you're not going anywhere. So you get the elders before the service 
to meet in good time and you ask them to be praying for you and then you come in there and you pray with them but also ask the congregation if they want to join in the prayer meeting for before the service let them come and have people come to pray before the service absolutely vital absolutely vital there should be prayer before a service there should be prayer before a service and good prayer and prayer with intention prayer with commitment so you pray with your deacons and your elders and like I said if they're not backing you you need to tell them I've had situations where the elders come in the late some of the elders aren't coming in to pray with me some of the elder, uh, some of the people were coming in who were trying to organize worship service part of it coming in interrupting the prayer time and you can't work with people like that if they don't understand prayer and the importance of prayer before the service then you're in a hide into nothing in a church that isn't going to be praying. So pray. Then, when you get into the pulpit, you need to open in prayer. how you structure your service and the way you structure your service is up to your church and the way the culture of your church and how you feel as a pastor or as a preacher just a little note there are preachers today that are being sidelined who are not pastors and they're invited to preach and then they have these worship leaders going on and on and on and it's come to the point where these worship leaders have become more like little gurus and basically there comes a point where you have to make a stand and I think preachers today need to make a stand they need to, they need to kick up a fuss about it uh, as, uh, I don't know what it's like in America but the preachers need to kick up a fuss about it in the UK for the last 10 years there's been these worship leaders that have taken control of the uh, services and when an, a preacher is invited to the service they're inundated by these worship leaders who take it upon themselves to give little mini sermons before the service and this has become a kind of evangelical tradition where the, where the worship leader feels that they have to give a, a mini sermon before the main sermon when a preacher comes, they should be in charge of that whole service. And you as a church, or you as a worship leader, or anywhere in the country, if you're in a church, you ain't in charge of that service. The moment that preacher gets up and expounds that word, they ain't in charge. And the control of... of who's in control of the service has, has moved from the preacher to the worship leader and so when preachers are invited to preach they're not given the respect that's due they are called of God to preach and if they've been invited to a church to preach you shouldn't be telling them what to do if they're getting up to expound the word of God they should be allowed to lead the worship and say how the worship's going to be they have to understand your particular culture the way you are as so long as they agree with that but the actual leading of the service what tends to happen is there are a lot of these worship leaders that will spend 10 minutes talking and drivel and giving little sermonettes before the preacher who's been invited gets in to do the preaching because these little worship leaders have become little popes where they now rule the roost and even the pastors are frightened to tell them off. Even the elders are frightened to tell them off because they've got into a tradition. And a lot of the congregations are, are going downhill because they're not respecting the preachers. They're allowing the kids to 
to muck, muck about in the service and talk in the service and um, the preacher's not shown any respect so half, some of the kids are in the service and they're just talking and doing things and people are getting up and going to the toilet and there's all these distractions and the poor preachers are finding it difficult to preach they've not only got the issue of the silly worship leaders but they've got people in the congregation who are just clueless about how they should react to a preacher that the preacher has come there with a message of God and he should be respected we've come to hear what God has to say and the, the lack of respect to preachers is lamentable these days and that's down to the church leaders who are failing to have any respect for God because they're not showing respect to God because they're not teaching the congregations to respect the preacher the leaders should say to the worship leader look when the preacher comes ask them what they want do they want water have they got any bible readings and cut your sermonette out we've, we've got a full sermon so we don't need your sermonette so just cut it out and they should be told and the elders should say look we know your kids need to talk and whatever but take them into the sunday school hall and let them do it there if they can't be quiet but if they're in in the service they need to listen for the sake of everybody else if the kids don't want to listen and they want to color and they want to talk then put them in the vestry you're not teaching your kids you're not showing your kids the honor of god if you're allowing your kids to cut to color in a service you're not teaching god is god you're teaching that god isn't to be respected it's an absolute shambles and a lot of evangelical churches are allowing the kids to colour and to talk in the services and, and they think they're being evangelical oh God's not going to judge them and God's not going to bother no God's not going to bother but he's also not going to bother about blessing your church because you're not showing him any, any respect the heathen no better respect than that it's the, it's the same thing of taking let's imagine you visited the police station and you took your kid there and the police the, the sergeant wanted to question you and you had your little kid sat on your lap coloring and talking back to the sergeant the sergeant is there to do a job and you're there to do a job you're there to talk to the sergeant if you want your kid to be happy get your grandma or get someone to look after the kid while you go and talk to the police officer and having your kid on your lap coloring while the police officer is talking and then the, poli the, the kid back chatting to the police officer is not showing any respect to the police officer better off to get someone in the family to look after the kid say okay police officer what do you want to talk to me about Or if the police officer visits your house and you've got three kids and they're all playing and, and having a laugh and mucking about in the front room. And the police officer's trying to talk to you. If you had any respect for the police officer, you say, look kids, will you go up to your room? I need to talk to the police officer. It's just, you're not showing any respect to God or teaching your kids about what who God is by letting them be disrespectful in a service. It's not about law. I'm not interested about law. It's not about putting people down and kids down. It's about the fact that evangelical services are becoming shabby. They're becoming slapdash. And that means it'll be, the churches will become loose in morals and loose in theology. And that's what we're already seeing. And apathetic. These churches are going to end up liberal and they're going to die if they don't change. Thank God not a lot of even not all evangelical churches are like these churches, but churches that have become like this will die. Uh, make no bones about it. They're not going to prosper. Because what you're saying as a parent, I don't care about God. That's what you're saying. God's not great. And kids, God's not great. So just cover. And just talk about talk talk about things 
and and you know don't worry about it God's, God's not great that's what you're saying that's what you're saying you won't see that happen in a, in a mosque you won't see that happen in the Jehovah's Witness Hall you won't see that happen in any other place but you'll see it happen in an evangelical church and that's a disgrace that shows how how we've we've descended into shabbiness so the way you dress I'm not advocating these old style brethren churches where you wear suits and no one can say anything and it's all it's all formal I'm not advocating that I'm just saying that the preacher should come dress smart make sure he's prayed make sure he's had people pray make sure he gets into the church and make sure that that preacher is respected by the church and by by the worship leader uh, that's all I'm saying because you're showing respect to God as a church and the preacher can't do his job if there's no atmosphere of expectation from God from his man no sense of prayer no sense of we want God to bless and we we want to live for God and hear what God has to say if you just come in in a slapdash way bossing the preacher around giving your little sermonettes before he preaches letting your kids talk and mess around people go into the toilet when the preacher's preaching and all the rest of it then you're just showing disrespect to God and the preaching can't achieve anything because God's not going to bless it so you need to turn up as a preacher in a prayerful attitude dress smart you get in the pulpit and when you're in the pulpit you have faith that the Holy Spirit's going to work you 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 are there to catch the wind you are there to allow God to work through you you're an instrument of God and as you're preaching the Holy Spirit will take over your message the Holy Spirit will just anoint in different ways in in waves upon wave your message when he wants there'll be a power and an unction from the Holy Spirit and sometimes you'll feel it sometimes you won't but as you get into that pulpit the Holy Spirit will suddenly come upon you and it's the most thrilling exhilarating experience you could ever have and you will feel the sense of the Holy Spirit descend upon you it's called the sacred anointing and he will baptize your message with such power that you almost want to explode with joy but as you get into the pulpit you go in expecting that expecting the Holy Spirit to move sometimes you might not feel the Holy Spirit but people are riveted because you didn't realize the Holy Spirit was just working powerfully in the congregation so when you get up the first thing as you read that scripture before you as you prayed you allow the Holy Spirit to work How you use your hands and what you do is up to you. I walk up and down the pulpit. I move my hands. I shout. I'm quiet. I'm passionate. I'm not. I throw my whole being into preaching when I'm preaching. But some preachers are quiet. Some people have, you know, some people are logical. Some people are. They're, they're all different types of preachers. So the way you use your body is up to you. You know, some key things that Stuart Olliott said in, in his preaching, book on preaching. Um, he's, he's done a couple of great books on preaching, really, really great books on preaching. Google Banner Truth Stuart Olliott on preaching. There's two, at least two books. There might be more. But he's written two brilliant books on preaching. They are pearlers. And in one of the preaching, in one of the books on preaching, he talks about eye contact. Make eye contact with your congregation. That's powerful when you're preaching, because if you've been if you've been in the scriptures all week, and if you've been praying all week and preparing your mind all week, praying all week, if you've been doing that, and you're in the spirit. When you start preaching and you're looking at people, 
They'll see heaven through your eyes. They will see that you've had contact with God through that week. They'll see it. If you've been watching pornography, if you've been doing sin, they'll know. They'll see it. They'll see it. They'll see right through you. But if you've been spending time with God and spending time with Him, your eyes will tell them what's happened. And your eyes will will be used by God to communicate to them the power of God. So look at each individual, look at people, gaze at people, stare at them. Look at each individual. And that will keep their attention, by the way. And keep looking at them. Use your eyes. Your eyes are going to do more preaching than your mouth. As you look at them, let, let them see your eyes. Look at them. And they'll see the time that you've spent in prayer. They'll see the time that you've spe spent studying. They'll see it in your eyes. They'll see it. Uh, as you're preaching, as the Holy Spirit anoints your message, keep looking at their eyes. Look at their eyes. Your body language is up to you, how you use your body language. Um, how you use your body language is up to you. So, I'm quite dramatic. I'm a dramatic preacher. I'll put my hands up. I'll bang the pulpit with my hand. I'll do all sorts of things. I'll spin round. I'll walk up and down and all the rest of it. But as you're preaching, you're basically hiding and you're just lifting Christ up. You're just magnifying Him. It's pushing Him up. You're, you're, you're lifting Him in everything you're saying. So even though you might do whatever you're doing in body language, you shouldn't be conscious of it. Be conscious. These people who try to be conscious and uh, of how to use their body language, that's false preaching. You don't. You, you should be so concerned about the glory of God and not about how you're moving your hands. And nerves, if you've got nerves, they'll go. As soon as you start preaching, God will help you with your nerves. Nerves is natural. If you're not nervous, there's something wrong with you. So, especially if you're a young preacher, if you get up in the pulpit and you're really, really nervous, sometimes you can be nervous so bad you go to the toilet. I know I've been there. You know, that's natural if you're a preacher. Uh, nerves, worried about getting up into the pulpit. It's, it's it's a natural thing. All I can say is there comes a point where you just have to hand over to God and get going in the sermon and trust that God will help you and you'll find that God will help you. God will help you to say. And if you if it's your first time in preaching, the the people will be there to encourage you. They will want to encourage you as a preacher. The vast majority of people will be so delighted that you've come to preach or it's your first time and they will want to encourage you to preach okay so the um, so you let the Holy Spirit work you're magnifying Christ you you use the body language that's suitable to you don't try to be artificial don't try to be someone else and don't try to be like Dr. Marty Lloyd-Jones. Don't try to be like John MacArthur. Don't try to be like Stuart Olliot or R.C. Sproul or any of these great preachers. Just be you. There's only one you. You're unique. God's chosen you for a reason. Only you could add something at that time. And that's why he's chosen you. So that's the best thing is, is remember just to be you. Right, um, just practical things though to watch out for. Um, uh, practical things, and then we'll we'll close it. Well, um, have some water. Make sure you've got water there. Um, I I was called two jugs J. I used to have two jugs. <laughs> Um, I used to have a jug of water and have about two or three glasses of water. Um, try and let God do the work. 
okay That's, this is important sit back in when I mean sit back sit back in your mind and rest on the word and the Holy Spirit and let God do the the work right you can preach in the flesh where you're trying to affect people and you're trying to be passionate and you're trying to change people and you're trying to change the whole church or your whole community and and you're trying to be powerful in your preaching and it can be in the flesh and it doesn't achieve what you wanted it to achieve the best thing to do is sit back in your preaching yes be passionate but but don't try to change the co congregation the whole or the whole community just say Lord as I preach I hand this message to you and you'll achieve what you want and I'll preach in the power that you give me so I'm going to preach and as I preach the anointing that you give I will move with that and that's what you want to do and, and let God work through you in that way so don't try and over preach yourself to try and change people sit back in your mind and rest in the word and rest on the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work you're preaching but you're preaching in response to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to work okay um, what else is there um, just trying to think what else is there yeah I think there's a difference between gospel preaching and uh, pastoral sermons I think that you should always bring Christ into every sermon so try and bring Christ into every sermon there should be in every sermon there should be some gospel but some messages will be principally gospel so try to have services where people know there are gospel services and bring family and friends to it and then have Bible teaching services where you're just teaching the Bible generally on issues but there has to be a balance of gospel preaching every week and also Bible teaching some people say well I don't do gospel preaching I just preach the Bible and if the gospel comes out but I think that you should have a specific service for gospel preaching so you're intending to com see people converted and that you encourage people to bring people to get converted um, that's become contentious now people or pastors don't agree with that but I think that's the best way uh, and uh, if you do that you'll see results you'll see people getting converted um, always be ready to learn always be ready to learn there's always going to be some quirk some issue that needs to be ironed out you're always going to have a bad habit somewhere along the line maybe you're a preacher and you scratch your nose and pick your nose I don't know but you'll have some bad habit somewhere or something and every now and again someone will mention it to you and be open to be criticized constructively it's hard to take constructive criticism but always be ready to learn and grow yourself but always be remembered that there are always people who are going to try and pull you down and nitpick and you've got to discern who are the ones who are trying to encourage you and maybe they see a foible maybe you've said something that was not right or whatever and they want to correct you on that and you need the correction and you'll need it till you're about uh, tell you in your last days as a preacher but you need to discern between those who are caring and, and, and are really genuinely concerned and want to mention something to you and even if you're the best preacher there'll be something that needs they'll mention I'll get mentioned maybe once every blue moon but at the same time um, at the same time there are people and you'll get them every week there'll be someone every week in the congregation who will have an issue with you 
it might be and often it's transfers they've got issues and they're putting it on you as a preacher so someone will who's no good at preaching will come up to you and say, I didn't agree with you preaching, I thought it wasn't good here and go. And, and it's all because they don't preach and they can't preach and they think they're a preacher. And they're pulling you down. So you've got to discern who are the ones who are trying to criticise you for the sake of criticism and pulling you down to the ones who really care and just are mentioning something. So you might have made an off-the-cuff remark in an illustration that was not wise. You might have said something or done something in your illustration or whatever that was not wise you might have a bad habit where you scratch your bum I don't know something stupid and nobody's ever said anything and then many years later someone mentions it to you but nobody else mentioned it because they didn't have the guts so you just got to be willing to take criticism constructively where God wants you and God will always give you someone you know, he'll always give you someone who'll encourage you at the end of a service and someone who'll discourage you to keep you humble. Um, your best critic should be your wife. So your wife should tell you where you're going wrong. If your wife doesn't tell you where you're going wrong, you've got real problems, not only in your ministry, but in your marriage. But your wife needs to be honest with you. And if you're a pastor's wife, if you're a minister's wife, tell your husband the way it is. Tell him. If he doesn't like it, tough that he married you. So as a wife, you've got to be honest with him because no one else is going to be. People are not going to tell him the foibles that he has. So you need to tell him. You need to be honest. And you as a husband need to listen to your wife. You need to take constructive criticism from your wife and not be so bullish. If your wife says your preaching's too loud, then listen to your wife. If your wife says that you shouldn't be saying that, you need to listen to your wife. God has given you a wife for a pur purpose. And part of one of the reasons why he's given you a wife is because you needed more wisdom than you have. Because you haven't got all the wisdom. You're not as smart and you're not as wise as you think you are. Your wife is more smarter and wiser than you. And I said that to every pastor, every preacher out there who's married. Your wife is more wiser than you. That's why God gave you the wife. So if the wife is telling you you're too loud, listen. If your wife is telling you that you're going off beam, you need to listen. Preaching, God chooses preachers who are strong-minded, who are can focus and be dedicated to preaching. And so they're strong-minded. And preachers who tend not to listen to people, even the humble ones, tend not to listen to people. And that's because of the nature of preaching. You've got to be a person who's dedicated to proclaiming the word and strong-minded. But be, you can be too strong-minded. You can be too stubborn-headed. Even if you've been through the humbling school of God. And if your wife tells you, love, you're not preaching the way you should be preaching, take it on board. But also the wife, you need to encourage your husband. Preaching, when a person preaches at the end of preaching, it's a very emotional experience. And very often a preacher at the end of a service will feel tired and depressed because they've used so much emotional energy. They've used a week's emotional energy within an hour. And they'll be depressed and they'll be vulnerable after that service. So as a wife, it's no good complaining and moaning at your husband for whatever issues or whatever after a service. Because your husband will be tired after preaching. So you need to be sensitive. You need to encourage your husband. You need to offer utter soft and encouraging words to your husband. Not bash him over the head. Not get him discouraged by... Talking about issues that are getting him down. But you need to encourage your husband as a preacher or as a, as, a, as a pastor. God has put you there to encourage your husband. And just an aside, those who are preachers and pastors in your marriage. Um, preaching isn't everything. That's not everything. As preachers, we can make preaching everything. 
But that's not everything. What is everything is God. And your relationship with God. And then the next thing that's important, everything to you, is your wife. And then your children. If you've got children. That is your priority. And... Your family will be blessed and your children will be blessed if you put them first. It's no good if you've won a whole church for Jesus but at the end of your days you've lost your wife or you've lost your three kids or four kids or five kids or whatever it is. And you've lost your kids. So you need to make sure you pastor your wife and pastor your kids first and that you give them the love and attention. There should be a time in the week where you make sure as a preacher, as a pastor, you put it aside for your wife. You take her out for a meal, you buy her flowers and you treat her as an utter, uh, utmost queen and you give her that time. And the wife, you need to make sure that you give your husband that time. You need to make sure that your kids, as a wife, that... Your, your kids know that the bit most important relationship in your life is your husband. You need to make your kids realize that. And, you, and husbands, you need to make your kids realize that your wife is everything. And you need to demonstrate that to your kids. And the kids need to grow up seeing that the husband and the wife are utterly devoted and committed to each other. That's before preaching, before being a pastor, that is your priority as a husband and wife, is that you are devoted to each other. Forget about your ministries, forget about your call, forget about your rights, forget about what you think. Your responsibility as a wife is to be dedicated to your husband and your responsibility as a husband is to be dedicated to your wife there's nothing worse to be in a marriage where it's a loveless marriage where the wife doesn't feel loved and the husband doesn't feel loved it's a terrible experience and that often this is because the husband and the wife are both most marriages there's a lot of history and baggage and people take it into the marriage and what it is people are crying out in their marriages for love but they don't know how to express it and they end up expressing themselves in a way that damages the other spouse so the husband is crying out for love for the wife but the wife doesn't understand how to give it to the husband and the wife is crying out for love from the husband and the husband doesn't know how to give it to the wife and in pastoral ministry and preaching, this is often the case. And there's often disharmony in the marriage. And the pastor and the preacher is trying to be the preacher, trying to get on being a pastor, but is struggling at home with their marriage. And it all comes down to this, that the wife and the husband need to come back to first ask the question, are you converted? Do you know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus, then you need to get to know Jesus if you're in the ministry. As you know Jesus, then you need to ask the question, I, am I, does Jesus love me? Does God love me? And that's where you need to deal with your marriage problems. Both of you need to deal with marriage problems from that perspective. You just need to sit back, shut up about your rights, shut up about how you... The wife has hurt you or the husband's hurt you. Shut up about all these issues. About injustices that have been done to you. Whether a husband or a wife. What you need to do is come to God. And say Lord help me to understand your love for me. And as you begin to meditate on the love of God. And realise that God loves you. You will suddenly change in your way of dealing with your husband you will suddenly change 
as you deal with your wife because your security isn't in your ministry because your ministry security in your ministry seeking that is seek, seeking to be appreciated by your spouse by your community you need to be secure in God you need to know that God loves you that God's not going to leave you that God cares about you and meditate on the love of God and that will set you free and you'll be able to love your wife in a way that you've never loved her before and you'll be able to love your husband in a way that you've never been able to love him before because your security now is in the love of God to know that God loves you and that's how to deal with issues in your marriage as a preacher is to come to understand the love of God for you again and so the home life of a preacher has to be that the wife and the uh, and is put first and the kids and so you need to make sure that you don't neglect them make sure you have a week a day where you give it solely to your wife make sure that through the day you have time with your kids uh, and spend time with your kids um, that 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 is going to be your legacy at the end of the day is your kids and then um, I would say try and make sure that in your preaching in the in your ministry that there are there is regular prayer for you as a preacher if you're an itinerant preacher try and get people to pray for you and, and get a prayer team for you uh, say look I do a bit of itinerant preaching here and there would you pray once a week for me and uh, get a prayer team for your ministry if you're a pastor ask for volunteers to, to be intercessors for you in your pastoral and preaching ministry start a prayer chain not just for yourself but for everybody else where there's constant prayer going on in the church and that the church is covered all the time in prayer um, and be expectant expect God to work in your preaching expect him to convert people expect him to change the church change people expect great things from God have faith recognize there'll be opposition if you're going to preach you will have opposition and be ready for it and be determined to face it down you're going to be opposed if you're preaching the word of God you have to be ready for that when John Calvin was training preachers he would criticize them some of them would get really upset and angry with him but he did it to train them he purposely criticized them to train them to take criticism and if you're going to be a preacher you're going to get criticized you're going to get opposition Charles Simeon he was a great preacher um, in the Anglican Church in Cambridge 1700s they locked him out of his own church for 10 years they kept locking him out he had to get in another different way and he, he couldn't use some of the church because it was locked from him he got laughed at by the lecturers at Cambridge and the students but for 10 years he kept going and he preached but he got a lot of stick Spurgeon when he was preaching when the first big church he was in in London got burnt down people died people criticized him for preaching and said he was a horrible preacher because people died because the church got burned down and the, the hall where they were preaching got burned down and people died he, he had to suffer with depression he got a lot of uh, criticism uh, and so if you're going to be a preacher you're going to get opposition Jesus our Lord 
was crucified. You can't get more opposition than that. The Apostle Paul was stoned and thrown here, there and everywhere. Jeremiah was attacked, thrown down a pit. All the great preachers have had to suffer for the gospel. So if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to suffer for the gospel. But it's the greatest work that you could ever do. It's the greatest work that you could ever be called to. If you're preaching outside, it's a different story. I would say that if you're preaching outside, it's the equivalent of preaching in a jungle. And I would say it's a much harder work than in a church. It's a much, much tougher work doing open air preaching. Some areas can be more tougher than others, but it is a very, very tough, tough. I would say the style of preaching in, in the open air, you have to choose which is the best for you, whether to use a mic or not, whether to stand on a stepladder or not. I don't stand on a stepladder at the moment because it's kind of a little bit conf confrontational, so I don't do that, but I have done. I don't use a mic, but I have used a mic because it can be too loud for me because I'm quite a loud preacher. But I would say the advice I would give for the open air preaching I would say if you're going to be an open air preacher you need to do a lot of knee work you need to be a lot more in a lot more prayer a lot more intercession you need to take it if you take preaching serious you need to take street preaching twice as serious because it's twice as hard it's really really hard in street preaching you can have a crowd that are out to to get you literally out to get you and not only five, you can have a hundred people. I'd say if you can get a team with you, that's real help. And pray that God would have a team. Pray that God would have prayer warriors for you. That is, it's strange, but the church doesn't recognize street preaching. So it's very difficult to get people to pray because... They don't see it as a, a legitimate church ministry because the church has forgotten the, the need to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. So it's very difficult to, to get people to pray. But you, if you can, encourage people to pray for you. And if you can get a team of prayer, then that's great. Work with a team. Um... I would just say again, sit back on the Word and the Holy Spirit. You don't have to strive with the city or strive with the town. Just preach at a level where people can hear and allow God to do the work. Allow Him to do the work. And He'll do the work. Um, hecklers not a good thing generally uh, a lot of people who do preaching and um, don't like uh, a lot of evangelists and people who do open air work who don't preach don't like hecklers they think they're a problem but if you're a street preacher they're, they're a good thing generally because if you get a heckler people you get a crowd you get people coming to listen so hecklers can be helpful if Eclis try to uh, debate you how you deal with them and the way you deal with them is up to you if you want to debate them it's up to you if you want to preach over them it's up to you um, 
you just do it according to your style I think I sometimes debate them and sometimes I just preach over them um, be ready to engage and talk with people people will come up to you and want to ask questions ask God for discernment when people do that because you'll get a lot of people who waste your time there's a lot of people who come and they're trying to sound you out and they'll speak to you for two or three hours and they're not interested in Christianity they're not interested in the gospel they're just interested in trying to find out whether you can prove your point they're not interested in hearing about Jesus and they can waste your time you could have spent time with other people who are interested so pray that God will give you the wisdom at the end of your preaching all you can do is leave it with God because it's a very difficult situation because when you've done it in a church you can feel you've achieved something you go home you can come back next week and you can look at whether you, you're, your preaching has had some kind of effect whereas open air preaching it's very difficult to know what's happened because people turn up they go and you never see them again but you've just got to have faith to believe that God is doing his work and uh, I think that's the final thought I love open air preaching I think it's wonderful and uh, I think it's a great thing and I'd encourage people to do more of it uh, take a table out take some tracks uh, and go out and preach that's what I would say so Paul Wash has done some stuff on uh, open air preaching so so there we are okay that's I think five hours or six hours on preaching today so I hope I've given you some encouragement some provisos some thoughts I've done this series really for myself just to get back to thinking about what I was trained in what what was important to me and just getting back to to what that is for me so that's the whole point of why I did this series and if anybody can share in my reflection all the things that I've shared with you and all the things that I've learned over the years and um, that in my uh, journey my struggles and mistakes and failings that I lost sight of and that I just need to reflect and recover again so so there we are I hope that's been a blessing so thanks for listening and uh, love to everybody out there and I'm going to close in prayer I'll read Psalm 42 eh? and then we'll close in prayer As the heart panteth after the brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember thy things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God. With the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holiday. Why art thou, O cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of the Jordan and of the Hemonites, from the hill Messiah. Deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water pots, and all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the day, and in the night song shall he be with me, and my prayer unto God of my life. And I will say unto the God of my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? 
and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my continence and my God. O oh God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your love and grace, and I thank you for all your mercies and all your blessings, Lord. I thank you that you are my God and my King and my Saviour. And Lord, I thank you for your love today. I thank you that your mercies are new every morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are greater than our mistakes, that you are greater than our failings, that you are greater than our enemies, that you are a great God. And I thank you that you love us, Lord, and that you will never forsake us. And Father, we give you the praise and the glory in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are our God today. And we praise you and we honour you and we magnify your name and we give you the glory and the honour. And so God we praise you and worship you today and we thank you for all your goodness and all your love. And Father God I pray for all of us today, for the street preachers and the preachers that we know and all of us who have heard these messages today. I just pray for all of us that you would help us to be better people each day. Help us to be better disciples, Lord. Help us to be better Christians, to walk your way and to serve you. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you and to honour you in all things. And Father, I pray, help us to preach your word faithfully. Help us to serve you, Lord. And I pray for all the preachers today, that they would know your love and care, that you would surround them with your blessings and encouragement. Be with them, Lord, and help them, and comfort them, and show them your grace and your love and your care. Strengthen them against opposition. Refresh them and renew them. Bless their marriages and unite them in their marriages, and bless them with their wonderful blessings. Bless their ministries, Lord. May there be many converts in their preaching to everyone who hears these messages. May their converts be well and strong in your word. May, may they all walk with you, Lord. May they be Irenaeuses and Polycarps and Ignatians. May they be men mighty in the word and mighty for you. Bless them, Lord, with all your love and grace. Bless them, refresh them, renew them. And just bless them in their preaching and in their ministry. Keep them safe and comfort them. And, oh God, I am so sorry that I have failed you. I'm so sorry for that pride in my own life. That iron ball of pride that would not go. That needed to be crushed. and That needed to be taken out. And, oh God, I'm sorry for my pride. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my failure. I'm sorry for walking in the flesh. I'm sorry for failing you. I'm sorry for not realizing your love for me, Lord. I'm sorry for not realizing all the blessings. I'm sorry for not being as loving as I should have been. I'm sorry, Lord, for all my failure and sin. And for my hypocrisy, Lord, and my failure. I'm sorry of all these things, Father. I'm sorry for letting you down. I'm sorry for not being the man of God that I should have been. I'm sorry that, Lord, I've been a washout, a failure, hopeless, Lord. And I ask for forgiveness and I ask for mercy. I ask for grace, Lord. I'm sorry for letting everybody down. I'm sorry for letting you down. I'm sorry, O oh God, for my foolish ways. O oh God, I, f I ask for forgiveness for my weakness and my failure, for not being the man that you wanted me to be. I'm so sorry, Lord. But, O oh God... I publicly hand my heart to you tonight and I give you my heart I give you my body and I give you my will in all its frailty in all its failure and all its weakness and Lord I come and deserve nothing and I am nothing and I just come and I, I just say Lord I'm here I have no rights I have nothing and I am nothing I deserve nothing and I hand my whole life to you today. 
And I just say, here I am, Lord. Use me in whatever way you want. And, oh God, forgive me and help me, for my pride is great. My pride is great. Help me, Lord, and take away my pride. I thank you for this day and for your love and grace. I thank you for your great mercy and your great kindness and your great patience. I pray, O oh God, for all our family and friends and all the churches that we know. We pray for each one. I pray for my brother Mark, who is going into the ministry, Lord, that you would bless him in a mighty way. I pray, Lord, above all, that he would know your love, that he was his wife would know your love, that they would know your love, and that they would be strong in your love, that they would be blessed in your love. And I pray that you would bless them as a family too. And Father, I pray as they are going together in ministry that you would prepare them and bless them and encourage them. I pray that you would equip them and refresh them and renew them. I pray that Mark would just know your peace and comfort. That even though it's difficult in this job that he's in, that Lord, that you would teach him the lessons, although they be hard, that you would teach them the lessons that he needs to learn, that you would protect him and bless him and help him and encourage him. And I pray, Lord, that he would have the desire of his heart. And that, Lord, as he goes to see the bishop, the bishop would allow him, Lord, to go into training and to be a man of God. And I pray that he would have good blessing in his ministry. And clear to you, Lord, that they would be blessed in their ministry, blessed in all that they do as they go whether it be to Oxford or wherever, Lord, that they would be blessed, that they would be encouraged and renewed and refreshed. And I pray, O oh God, that you would just bless them, that their ministry would be flow with the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would equip them and give them all the help that they need by the Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would be full of the Holy Spirit, that you would anoint them, that the congregation that they go to minister to would be a place of prayer. A place of prayer night and day, praying for them. And we pray that it would be a place known for the Holy Spirit and of God. Bless them, Lord. We pray for fellow colleagues in Scotland that we know Pray that they will be blessed. We pray, O oh God, for the preachers of today, men preaching in your name, we pray for them today, O oh God, that they would be the Elijahs of today, that they would be raised up by you. We pray, O oh God, that you would anoint them pray that you'd raise up young ones to preach your word. Pray that they would be mighty in the scripture and mighty in preaching the word of God. And they would be like Aranaeus and they would be pastors of your own heart and preaching the word of God. And they would preach in season, out of season. They would have hearts of lions to defend your people and to defend the cause of God. We pray against the enemies of God. We pray against those who will come against your kingdom. Those who come against your word. We pray against them in the name of Jesus Christ. And we say, be gone. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you that you are our God. That you will give us victory. That we are on the winning side. That you are the living God. And you are our Savior and you are our God. We praise you, O oh God, and we worship you, and we adore you, and we live in victory, and we live in the praise and honor of our God today. And we look back at all those who went before us, Polycarp, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Sir Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Christostom, and Luther, and Latimer, and Ridley, and Calvin, and we look at all these great saints of God. Richard Baxter, John Bunyan, 
Whitfield, Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, Carey, Adonai Judson, C.T. Studd, Hudson Taylor, George Muller, Reese Howells, Campbell Morgan, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. We look at all the saints of the past and all the martyrs. Watchman Nee and all the martyrs. We look back at the noble servants of God who served you against all odds. And as we face our generation and as we face the challenges of our time we will not shrink God for we have a living God. We have a holy word. We have the aid of the Holy Spirit and we have our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. And so Lord we praise you and adore you and we honour you today as our God and Saviour and our King, Mighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We praise you and we adore you and we are adoring you as the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit and we praise your holy name. And let every demon and let every satanic force that comes against the people of God be gone in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ. Get be me high me, Satan, for we are covered in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin and Satan has no hold upon me. And he has no hold upon the, us and no hold upon you as we are covered in the blood of the Lamb. And so... May God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, preachers. Go in the strength of his might. Go and do the work of an evangelist. Go and do the work of an expositor. And preach the word of God. And I'll see you in glory. God bless you, folks. God bless you.